Okay, so I know that we when we first connected, you you were a cop before all this. Are you still doing that kind of work, or w- what's up with that? No, no, I left law enforcement uh, back in the fall of two thousand eighteen. Oh wow, that was a good time to get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're telling me I had a lot of people uh, telling me the exact same thing. You know, they still talk to me now, and uh, actually, a lot of uh, we have a lot of law enforcement, military, fire, and EMS patients that come to my clinic. Oh, wow. And every time they talk to us, you know, they're, they're like, man, he got out a good time. Like, what a great time to get out of the, <laughs> out of the profession. <laughs> well, too, right? The whole country, like, set aflame. And, you know, and, well, knowing, so I, you know, I do the government side of things. And, I, you know, I was originally a, a special conservator. So it's kind of like a constable kind of thing. And, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq was kicking off. And so I ended up as a law enforcement advisor in Iraq like wow. teaching Iraqis, <laughs> which is not a thing, by the way, like, <laughs> like, okay, we're going to teach these guys and, you know, or they have like sixth grade level education, that sort of stuff. So, um, but when I got out there, like that was all that I could do. And I didn't have any plans on, you know, doing the whole government thing and whatnot, but it just kind of wound up that way. And um, I, I just can't imagine like the guys right now having, you know, gone through what, 2016 through 2019, <laughs> all that stuff, right. And the TBIs that you can get just from that experience alone. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the, uh, the job wasn't, you know, all, uh, all positive even before I left. I mean, you know, it was, uh, probably like six or seven years ago, no, maybe, maybe five or six years ago, it started to kind of go south, you know, and it's, it's a pendulum. Wow. Law enforcement's a pendulum. It goes back and yeah. forth. Sometimes it's really good for law enforcement. Sometimes it's real bad. And <laughs> I just happened to leave right when it was getting real bad. So yeah. When you, were you in the military before all this? No, no, I went, uh, I actually wanted to go to the military. So that yeah. was a deal that I made for, uh, with my parents. And, uh, I was in high school, you know, when nine 11 happened and, my first instinct was, all right, I'm going, I'm going to the army or I'm going to the Marines, one of those two. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my family was like, all right, listen, you're a hothead. You're 18 years old. You need to calm down. You're going to go there and get yourself yeah. killed. They're like, go to college. They're like, then if you want to <laughs> still go to the military, go as an officer. I'm like, all right, deal. Yeah. So I went and, uh, you know, and then instead of, you know, by the time I was done with college and ready to graduate and everything, I kind of just uh, transitioned into law enforcement outside of uh, oh wow outside of the military, which you know, as yeah. you know, law enforcement ended up being almost uh, almost as dangerous <laughs> as some of the uh, military assignments I would have been put. Well, on. And actually, you were in, you were in Cleveland also, right? Because I, I, I my family's in Kent State. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was so in I worked Ohio. for a CMHA, uh, Cleveland oh, yeah. Metropolitan Housing Authority. Mm-hmm. That was nuts. <laughs> That's a war zone. <laughs> yeah, that's that's I mean, you know, you're talking you're talking the, uh, you know, the ghetto, the ghettos, basically the uh, yeah. the projects that they built. And I mean, it's that's just kind of how wow. that is. Um, Are you yeah, still worked, out there in, uh, in Ohio or where, where are you at now? Yeah, I worked northeast Ohio for five years and then I came down to Clearwater, Florida, worked law enforcement for seven years. Oh, and wow. uh, I'm currently living in Orlando, Florida. Oh, wow. so, OK. I was going to ask you about that. So you. Because uh, you have two separate locations for Aspire Rejuvenation. Yes. So I have a clinic in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that I'm partnered with uh, Dr. Joseph Clark. And then I have this Orlando clinic here in Orlando, Florida. And oh, wow. I'm, in, I'm in talks of uh, opening up clinics in Atlanta, Georgia, and Las Vegas, Nevada here in the next six months. Wow. How does that work in terms of like... You know, on the top end, right? So say that you're a clinic owner, like nobody mm-hmm. talks about this kind of like the special sauce of this. So say you're a clinic owner and you want to expand instead of just necessarily doing the the telemedicine only model or I guess maybe like purchasing someone else's clinic, what would be the benefits of opening up another one in another state? So a lot of people, you know, believe it or not, even though telemedicine is very popular and we do telemedicine here, um, having a brick and mortar is really a a good way of kind of giving people a little bit of comfort when it comes to what we're doing. So, I mean, when you're talking about hormone therapy, you're talking about controlled substances, you're talking about, you know, hormone therapies that are drastically able to change people's lives. 
And, you know, when you see these online clinics that don't really have a location, uh, you know. And they don't have a doctor's name even on the website. Yeah. You see that all over the place. And, you know, we, uh, you know, what we are, we're very extremely transparent. And me being ex-law enforcement, we are extremely by the book. We do things the correct way. You know, we have all of the licensing in place. You are always talking to a practitioner, always getting blood work. Uh, you know, I can't say the same for some of these clinics out there. It's it sounds a little crazy oh, yeah. to even say. Uh, you know, Jim Bob's, uh, you know, TRT clinic or whatnot. You know, I I ended up going through one of them because I had a GP that I was going through who was OBGYN and like a functional medicine guy, but he did his training like 30 years ago. So mm-hmm. I was bumbling around. He had me in clomid monotherapy for like a year. My eyes swelled up. I had like a bunch of floaters in my eyes. And now that I know, right, Clomid's a toxic medication. We have n now, which you could just use that, and it doesn't have, have the problems. But, you know, this idea of throwing someone with traumatic brain injury on Clomid monotherapy, now that I kind of know what I'm talking about, is just not the best plan to do things. And since we have these other tools, you may as well just use the other tools, and especially locally when you can actually talk to somebody. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of where the local clinic kind of comes in. I mean, we still have a lot of people that, We'll even drive a pretty fair distance. We had people driving from Northern Florida, you know, a couple hour drive, and they want to come and meet us in person. They want to see their practitioner in person. They want to meet the doctor or the nurse practitioner. They want to meet me. They want to meet who they talk to on the phone. You know, kind of like an old school thing. For me, you know, we're in the we're in the world of Zoom meetings now. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, for me, you know, for this uh, for this venue that we're doing to get the information out there, it's, it's wonderful. But for me to have like a business meeting uh, that has to do with, you know, whether it's a pharmacy or having somebody open a clinic, I'm big on face to face. You know, I like shaking someone's hand. I like seeing them in person. I like seeing how they react to what I'm saying. So, you know, there's a lot of patients like that. And I mean, realistically, the patient base that we're seeing, they're. 35, 40 plus. So they're a little older. Yeah, old yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, like, I, I, I just kind of take it for granted because all the military and law enforcement guys were all in between 25 and 40 with traumatic brain injury, right? We're sure. all Gen X, millennial kind of people. So we can go between the two models. Whereas if you have someone who's definitely not or older Gen X, they really don't want to deal with the internet at all, let alone if you're, you know, older generations. So I could definitely understand that. And especially too, when we're talking about hormones, the the vast differences of the, the the symptoms that you have, or even if you're on a specific therapy, I mean, they could really change. And so I guess that's a good question to kind of start off on is, you know, how does someone get started with the spiral rejuvenation? So the easiest way to do it is just uh, go to the website. Um, we have everything kind of set up digitally for you to contact us, and we have a uh, you know a lot of information on there, different therapies, peptide therapy. Hormone therapy for women, testosterone therapy for men. You know, you can you can do all of your research on there for all the different programs and uh, medications that we offer. And every single page is a contact us form. Very easy. Oh, it's, just, okay. it's just a name, email address, phone number, and you can you know basically select a topic that you're interested in or write in a topic that you're interested in. Oh wow! And okay. we, that comes directly to us at the office. We get the email. Excuse me. We get the email. And, uh, you know, we contact the patient directly as they request. So if you want a phone call, you're going to get a phone call within a 24 hour window. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. We don't sit there. We don't sit there and wait for, you know, two, three days and, you know, have people wondering whether we're going to contact them or not. We're very quick. And, uh, you know, we really want to help people here. So we know when people are messaging us and wanting to get on, you know, hormone therapy or wanting to get their hormones checked, they're feeling something. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're, they're going through something, so they don't want to wait. They want, they want answers and, I, and we get it. Yeah. And um, like in my case, right. So, you know, when I first originally watched Joe Rogan and he had Dr. Mark Gordon and Andrew Marr on there, and he's talking about depression, erectile dysfunction, feeling like crap, your brain feels like crap. You don't have any energy. I was like, Oh, okay. This is something I need to, you know, take care of. And so I went to my you know functional medicine guy. He's a, OBGYN family doc in a small town, you know, he's doing his own thing. And here I'm expecting, you know, to do certain stuff. And, you know, we did the Clomid thing and then I learned, okay, well, that's not right. 
And then we did a hundred milligrams of test and it was just like once a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he had me on like a gram of AI or uh, aromatase inhibitor, uh, you know, for a week or <laughs> something crazy. And I had all these symptoms. I didn't really know what was going on. I was doing a bunch of research and then I kept going to these clinics uh, in around the, the DC area and it was all bioidentical hormone replacement pellets and it was a beauty clinic i'm like okay what where do i go <laughs> to get you know traumatic brain injury or just you know, hormone replacement in general with a knowledge you know uh, knowledgeable clinic and it was honestly pretty difficult and this is 2018 19 time periods at that time it was still kind of the the wild west in my opinion I, we really didn't have what we have now yeah yeah exactly i mean you know these things did not exist to the extent they do even five years ago, you know, there, there was a few clinics here and there going around and, you know, they were accessible to some people, but of course, anytime you talk with hormones, uh, for women, women have been big on HRT for a long time and they usually yeah. their OBGYNs. They're, they're leaps and bounds ahead of all of us men, you know, for, for all, uh, for all the men out there, uh, basically we were seeing that midlife crisis thing, which is basically a drop in testosterone, a drop in most yeah. of your sex hormones as a man. We were seeing that as like, oh, midlife crisis, we're getting old. Let's go buy a Corvette and divorce our wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's ridiculous to even say, but I swear that was like the stigma. And then people just started realizing like, hey, no, it's not your wife. It's not your relationship. You don't need a new Corvette. You need to optimize your hormones and your wife and and uh, her sister and your mother and your grandmother are all doing it already. They just don't tell you about it. Yeah. And what, so what I find is interesting with that is the fact that, so we have all these people with, so the, I guess the number for TBI is roughly 3.9 million people or something like that a year are diagnosed. And my opinion is like, that's the actual population or probably almost 10% of the population has TBI that's untreated and they're not getting their hormones tested and the docs don't know any better and they're not going to run a C-reactive protein or, you know, you're free and bioavailable and total testosterone and, mm -hmm. and look at those levels. There's, oh, well, let's give you this SSRI and send you on your way. And then, oh no, you're a statistic on the TV when you go and do something bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, well, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> for, for military, for military, especially, I mean, you know, what, what the military goes through just generally, I mean, I'm not even talking about with T with traumatic brain injuries. I'm just talking about just in general, let's say you have no traumatic brain injury. You know, if you have, if you have had one, basically you are in need of some type of hormone therapy, almost guaranteed. Absolutely. Something yeah. is going to be messed up um, with your hypothalamus, with your pituitary gland, something is going to be off. It's just, it's, it's basically Absolutely. guaranteed. You know, Actually, just to, not to cut you off, but I just uh, got I talked to a friend, and I uh, was just having a, like a random conversation. Oh, how are you doing? Whatever, and like, oh, you know, I'm doing this testosterone thing, whatever. And I was, oh, he's like, oh, I just got my levels tested, and my doctor says that 300 nanograms per deciliter total testosterone is healthy. And I, I blew up and started screaming at the phone. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, that is not how that works. Like, your total testosterone, okay, is a good barometer, but mm -hmm. no, you you. And you're military and you're a soft guy and you're really like dealing with explosives mm -hmm. and like you're a breacher it's traumatic brain injury i mean like your hormones are messed up and he has all the symptoms too so we kind of went through the symptoms or whatever but like even the blood levels are just really irrelevant to be honest i mean i i don't see where and i in the in the guidelines right the guidelines say you know symptoms are you know what we treat and it's not by numbers alone but yeah yeah so that's exactly how we operate you know, the numbers do mean something, but they don't mean everything. And that's and that's really where people need to see the difference. You know, when you go to a normal doctor, they're going to check your levels. They're going to see, hey, you're between 200 and 900, you know, depending on what <laughs> scale they're looking at. If you from are the, from the 2013 LabCorp levels, right? Not the, not exactly. the 2008 levels. <laughs> exactly. So, you're, you know, you're looking. So if they come in at 201 to 899, <laughs> They're going to say, you're fine, you're in range. No matter what symptoms you have, no matter what <sighs> age you are, it's madness. Uh, we just had we just had somebody today actually call in, and uh, he's 19 years old, so he's an adult, but he's still going to an uh, uh, adolescent endocrinologist, okay? Okay. 
So he's going to, because he's still 19 years old, I guess, uh, you know, as long as you're in your teens, you can basically go to those. And uh, he had a testosterone level at 19 years old in the high 100s. What there's a, in heck? There's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, so there's that's something. A major there's problem. something happening there. And his doctor basically told him that he's 19 years old. Everything's fine. Everything will work out. This is an endocrine. That's a free testosterone level of like 0. 0.53 or something. I don't even know what that would be, but. But it's what, definitely low. Well, I mean, <laughs> and it's regardless like of a ninety-year-old. <laughs> yeah, regardless of his free testosterone level, that total testosterone is that of an eighty-plus-year-old man, oh, man who is not doing well. You know, I mean, we have an eighty, we have an eighty-three-year-old patient here, and he's at about an eight hundred level of uh, total testosterone, and the guy feels like a rock star. He's dancing yeah. down the hallway. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, well, and too know, with that kid, right? That number tells me that he's either been in a car accident. He has a congenital issue somewhere along the hypogonadal, mm -hmm. something rather something. And even if the, so, the so a regular endocrinologist sees a number and it's a young person, and they don't really want to put them on testosterone because they really don't know that HCG and H, HMG exists, mm -hmm. and they should like run their fertility. They don't know that exists. But even if you wanted to be conservative, you would look at it. You find out what the LH and FSH and all those little. Uh, brain to ball levels, which I like to call them. It's easier to talk about. Yep. And you find out those levels and then, okay, well, you might need a, a GNRA agonist or some HMG or some sort of medication to solve the pituitary stuff. And then boom, now they're working and they're doing great. But a 19 year old, that's rough. I cannot imagine how that would feel. Yeah. And the first thing that I asked, I was like, did they abuse steroids when they were a young teenager? Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and the immediate the immediate answer was no, he's never touched a hormone in his life. I'm like, okay, there's a serious problem. I'm like, yeah. something's either either damaged testicular uh, testicular area. So, you know, maybe he had a uh, uh, trauma to the testicles or yep. or traumatic brain injury, or there's something else going on inside that we just don't know. You know, and this is really important, though. The fact that you have an, like, an example of someone that's younger, I always try to use the 19-year-old Marine who just got back from Afghanistan, right? Or like this person is a good example, right? The age of the person does not matter at all. It, it's irrelevant. The, what matters is how they feel and what those numbers are saying and how they're responding. And a person that's that young <laughs> should not have those problems. Like that, that is a major problem. And there's no way the person can, uh, you know, react in school and, and have a real job and that sort of stuff. I mean, I personally been through it and it's rough. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's no way that him at 19, he's going to be able to function and succeed the way that he could, or even really develop. Let, let's, let's be real. 19 years old, we are not fully grown adults at that point. I think, oh, I yeah. think 25 we are still, right, for the brain. I mean, you're going to need how yeah. many years to fully develop that. So you're going to have mental retardation at a significant rate. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, 25 to 27, they're saying is the real age when you're really fully mature, you know? So, I mean, he's missing a lot there and who knows how much he's missed already. Cause he wow. probably had that declining hormone level from when he was a young boy and the fertility, right? So now you get with somebody boss, babe, She's got mm -hmm. her herbal life uh, <laughs> job. <laughs> she's hawking stuff. She's doing great. Now she's got some cash. I want to have kids. You're 22. And well, the guy can't have kids now. And he finds out. And the uh, you know, young adolescent endocrinologist guy should have caught it and said, okay, we're going to figure out what you're at and you know, not make a lifetime decision about you not being fertile, right? If you could, the kid's you know, not fertile, get him on the medication he needs. You know, get get a, a you know fertility sample. Make sure that's you know frozen and and move the guy along. But now, right now, he's risking not being fertile and not having to carry on his lineage and his heritage of his you know entire life. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot that goes involved uh, that's involved with it, a lot that goes on. And you know, unfortunately, even some of these quote unquote specialists, you know, these endocrinologists. I mean, they they are the hormone specialists of the medical industry. Um, <laughs> But when it comes when it comes down to it, I'm like, yeah, I'm baffled at how little they know when it comes to modern HRT treatment and, yeah. you know, modern administration of HRT with men, women, adolescents, so on. They're just they're like brainwashed into an old school way of thinking from yeah. textbooks that are almost 30, 40 years old. Yeah, I've been joking about this, that, uh, you know, my I, I, 
my goal is for functional medicine practitioners to steal testosterone replacement therapy away from endocrinologists and urologists. They let the situation specifically with the military get this bad. I mean, honestly, they may as well just steal it away from them. And, and really they have, right? Because now endocrinologists and urologists are all just focused on, you know, fertility and cancer and metabolic disease, right? They don't really focus on testosterone. And, and in a way, I actually kind of agree with it. They shouldn't. And, and honestly, nobody should go to them. Um, they don't have the thousands of patients and know on a, on a daily basis what it you know means to have a hyper responder, a guy who you give 50 milligrams to and he's, you know, has a 2000, you know, total level. And then someone like me, I'm fat and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obese and it takes me 290 milligrams to get up to 56 to, uh, free testosterone. So like, you know, you don't know that until you're working with it every day and you kind of have that experience. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of that, so I wanted to kind of you know ask you, where do you see the HRT world going? What, where, what is that next kind of step and the evolution of, of where we're at now? So, you know, I really do think it is going to become mainstream. And I'm going to say this very carefully, as long, it's going to go mainstream, as long as the FDA, the DEA, and Big Pharma allow it. And the reason yeah. I'm saying that is because, you know, what HRT can do for people is amazing. It's, I mean, we've had people come in and they're on antidepressants, antipsychotics, they're on statins, they're on, you know, all kinds of heart medication, blood pressure medication, all these things. And they have all these issues. And then we do something very minuscule, like optimize their testosterone, make sure they have an optimal estrogen or estradiol level uh, comparative to their testosterone, optimize their thyroid. And look at that. They're losing weight. Their blood pressure is going down. Their <laughs> cholesterol is going down. All these things are starting to cascade and fix, their, fix themselves all because their hormones are now optimal. You know, and as, as amazing as that is, it's scary to really put out there because Big Pharma and, you know, all of these entities that are in for making money, and we all know it, the medical industry is not necessarily all about helping people. It's just not. It's not yeah, something that I want to do personally is I want to create a nonprofit organization where at least that we can fund. Um, well, like right now, personally, I don't have a job and I'm, you know, having to do try to find something that's part time or whatnot. But there's other people that don't have the access to actually get optimized type of levels with decent clinics or whatnot and mm -hmm. to create something to where we have a nonprofit that's at least able to fund things, but also too, where the docs get paid and they can volunteer their time basically. So they don't need to even get paid by a patient. They can get, you know, treat some people and however that would work for the, you know, the association that they're part of their, you know, hours that they need to do each year, but have something like that to where we can actually give back, especially right now that I talked to a guy where he's going to have to show out two grand <laughs> for his TBI value. I'm like, no, you know, contact my buddy at another clinic or whatnot. But it, you know, something simple as that, where we could have thrown the money at it, but you know, I don't personally have it, and we need something like that that's more charitable, you know, to, to be there for people as well. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get involved in that eventually. Whether I do that with another organization or whether I do that uh, with my with my clinic uh, with Aspire Rejuvenation and make a nonprofit uh, association linked with it, I'd love to do this for. Uh, military and vets because i mean yeah. the va is still they, they there's one so guy by the way there's literally one guy who it works at the at the at the va who's a doc who knows how to do optimization training that, that's literally one guy that's it <laughs> for the entire yeah. va <laughs> it's that bad <laughs> and, the, and the other problem is is that you know for some of these vets and some of these ones that have the uh, disability and stuff like that some of them will not get the TRICARE coverage for testosterone and they're on a fixed income and maybe oh, they're, oh yeah, you know what I mean? It, it drives me absolutely nuts. And Which I, that's why I asked you kind of about where things are going to go, because one of my beefs, right, is that it's still a controlled medication mm -hmm. and most countries it's really not. And like, it's not really a thing. Mean, okay, if you do too much, you can have some negative kind of stuff. And maybe there's one person out of a, you know, 100,000 who you take too much, they're going to go nuts or something like that. But at 
you know, in terms of the, the amount of data that's out there, like no one's overdosed from it. Unless they were like freebasing methyl, methyl testosterone from like uh, the 1800s or whenever they originally synthesized it. They're sure, using sure. a methyl base or something like that. But as long as you're not using a toxic medication like this, and it's a safe medication like testosterone cypionate is, I don't see why it's still even controlled at all. Like it really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, the level of abuse and uh, harm that people can do with that drug comparative to several others. I, you know, Tylenol. But, I use the Tylenol example all the time. If I take three Tylenol or four Tylenols or more, I can have liver damage and die, right? Well, I just, you know, if you accidentally took a gram of testosterone, okay, you're going to feel like crap, but you're not going to die. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can, kill your, you can kill yourself with vitamins. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's very possible. You can actually overdose on certain vitamins, certain minerals, and you can die. Um, you know, just like you said with Tylenol, but I'm talking about vitamins. You can, dr you can drink too much water and die. <laughs> yeah, you know? I remember that one. I think he was like, I forget. It was like two... It was like two or three gallons or something like that. And it was some, some tests that they did or whatever. But, you know, I asked that, right, because I, I see that there's a, a, a shift that's changing, but mm -hmm. also the fact that if there's so many people that are getting off various medications, they're feeling good, and then it's kind of a normal thing where you just go get your testosterone and you're doing great. That too, right, there's also, the, like you, you talked about, where the, the, the big pharma piece where this Medicaid, and for women especially, it's practically free because they don't really need that much. So, I mean, the medications, what for them? It's like literally $10 a month or something crazy. And I, I, I find that it's interesting where we're, we're obviously we're paying more for the, the, the behind the scenes, the care coordinators. Uh, our fantastic owners um, and and the docs, right, and their experience. But there there is that that gap that's there, right? Because the medication is really not that expensive. But you know, we we really do need to get to a place where we can actually have more freedom to be able to do things. And it's still not that way being as controlled as it is. No, no. I mean, you know, honestly, even if they even if they kept it as a controlled class of drug and they wanted to keep towing that line. You know, it wouldn't bother me per se. Um, I understand their abuse um, idea of it. I don't think it's necessarily accurate, but I understand their idea of it. Um, when it comes to this treatment and how people have access to it and can get access to it, the problem becomes that it's the insurance companies. That The, the problem is the insurance oh, companies yeah, yeah, yeah. will really not play ball. And I was bagging on, uh, on United, my group, uh, you know, TRT for Warriors on Facebook, and I, you know, I literally printed out their their little testosterone guide, and they're talking about like a hundred milligrams every two weeks. It's like some some insane protocol. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're gonna get someone killed. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's not the way you're supposed to do things. And two, like you're promoting a specific milligram as an insurance company. Like, no, that is not how that works. Like, that is dangerous to do. And I was always surprised they would actually put it in, in, in paper like that. That it's their actual United Healthcare, you know, uh, methodologies and the way they, they do the treatment. Oh yeah, they will not approve. They will not approve patients uh, that are over a certain number of uh, total testosterone. Their testing is ridiculous. They require like three tests in one week or something like that. Or that might have been a different insurance company. Uh, regardless, it's you know their yeah. their guidelines are so stringent that it basically disqualifies 98% of the people <laughs> to actually get, get on that treatment. And, yeah. you know, and all of those people probably need it. You know, all those people are still feeling the symptoms. Yeah. I mean, I'm symptomatic when you put me under like 650 or 700. That's just oh, my, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's my symptomatic basically region. If you get me lower than that, I feel miserable. But yeah. I start to like, actually have, speaking of that right now, you know, I'm, I'm doing like a suboptimal dose for this human growth hormone glucagon stimulation test that I have to do. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't allow me to do it unless I was at a specific number. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It has nothing to do with it. And I'm reading all this stuff like, oh, wow. So doctors can't even uh, prescribe this off label. And you have to do the specific diagnosis and all these different different tests just to you know push out uh, you know growth hormone that is specifically the the code is for traumatic brain injury like what i have personally 
And I'm like, okay, if I have this diagnosis, my doctor can't just, you know, provide this medication to me. And it's like completely illegal. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. And I had no idea. And most patients don't know either. So it's all, you know, kind of all in line when we were talking about hormones and that there's that strict control over growth hormone. Like, wow, this is, this is not something I was prepared for, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, the the con- the controlled nature of growth hormone is crazy. I have no idea where or why that even came about. Um, there's speculation, and this sounds even funny to say out loud. There's speculation that a lot of that crazy control about growth hormone came because of baseball. You remember? I'm sure you remember the court uh, the court proceedings about the baseball and uh, the use of growth hormone and anabolic steroids. Um, I. I, I, I no, I, I don't remember it, to be honest. I, I, I heard about it in, in passing, but I don't think I've ever watched it or heard much about it. Sure. So, I mean, you know, you had uh, you had all those baseball players basically pop for steroids and growth hormone and things like that. And uh, there was that doctor prescribing all these people. And then, you know, Congress started passing legislation and things started getting oh, wow. more strict. And, you know, things went things went off the rails. And, I mean, things like growth hormone used to be able to be compounded by compounding pharmacies. Yes. And actually, one of the next uh, podcast episodes I want to have is with the owner of Olympia Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's a veteran. And I I didn't know. And they're one of the only pharmacies that actually produce it. I was like, wow, this is interesting. Uh, Growth hormone or they probably produce a... Oh, I'm uh, um, uh, HCG. uh, One of the only people... Oh, HCG. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so for so for HCG, yeah, they're one of uh, so far that I know of, they're one of four or five pharmacies that got the license um, <laughs> that, uh, in the whole country. So everybody yeah. else stopped making it because they weren't legally allowed to, and then Olympia was the first one to get the licensing, and then there's like wow. two or three other ones that got it um, down the line. Uh, one in Texas and uh, a couple other in Florida, and then I think one up in the New York, uh, New Jersey area. Oh, really? Okay. I haven't heard of that one. Interesting. Yeah. I only, I only work with Olympia and then a couple down in South Florida, only two pharmacies oh, wow. that I work with make it. And, oh, no, I uh, had to call up specific pharmacies when the first, uh, you know, kind of shut down thing happened with this stuff. And, sure. um, you know, I, I called up a bunch of places, a bunch of guys kept, oh, I can't get it. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I called up my own pharmacy and they had like the, the big pharma stuff. Like, hey, just go to these guys, get the big pharma stuff. Don't even deal with the, you know, whatever, you know, I obviously, you know, clinics have to make their money and that's one thing, but as a patient, if you need the medication and, you know, they're going to throw you on gonadarelin, and it's not really working or a different type of medication. It's not personally for you. Mm-hmm. Just go to a regular pharmacy and get the big pharma stuff. You can't fight the power too much. I mean, you, you might be able to find a compounding pharmacy that has it, but you may as well just find where it's closer to you and just get it. I mean, I, I don't see why all these guys were going through as much trouble as they were, but they didn't really do the homework. So obviously there's that part. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, un- unfortunately, uh, after after the compounding pharmacies ran out, obviously a lot of places, uh, retail pharmacies, they didn't keep huge stock of HCG. It wasn't that popular. Most of the HCG market was coming out of compounding pharmacies. And then really? and then in the fall of 2000, what was that just last fall, I think? Yeah, fall, fall October or so of last year, 2020, um, there was a national shortage. And then you couldn't find it in any retail pharmacy. You couldn't find the big pharma stuff. Oh, wow. It okay, got, interesting. It got, it got crazy, you know? And you know now they're, now they're caught up. There's stock everywhere. There's several pharmacies making it. And, you know, they, of course, uh, increased the prices as needed because the raw materials increased because supply and demand. We all know how that works. I'm pretty sure where the raw materials are coming from, correct me if I'm wrong, is China? Uh, not necessarily. It could be coming from India. It could be coming from Canada. It could be coming from the Middle East. It just depends on oh, really? who's contracted okay. where. <laughs> okay. I, from when I was doing some research on something else, it was like maybe a Scipionate or it was something, but there was literally only one place in China where you could get it. I was like, whoa, this is dangerous. This is a national security issue. Like, this is what I do for work. I was like, well, this is not good. And the government needs to get ahead of this. And I didn't really hear much about it after. I forget which medication I was looking up, but the raw material only came from that. And when, you know, COVID-19, uh, you know, started, the lockdown started happening or whatnot, you know, that that's when all that kind of problems had started. Um, Obviously, right with the whole, uh, you know, COVID-19, um, telemedicine, in my opinion, is here to stay. 
And that's where a lot of this revolution has happened in telemedicine and, and uh, getting care, you know, over the phone and online and, and whatnot. How do you see that remaining as we go forward? So telemedicine is not going anywhere. The legal, um, I guess the, the, the legal, the legal uh, definition of certain drugs going over state lines, um, the prescribing of controlled substances over state lines via telemedicine. I do think that is going to revert back to pre-COVID, oh, wow. to pre-COVID law. And I have a few uh, law enforcement and government sources that have kind of told me that's probably what's going to happen in the next year or two. Interesting. Uh, so pre-COVID, telemedicine was legal pretty much everywhere. Every state has their own guidelines. Nationally, there's a guideline. Uh, but the the transport, the sale, and the shipping of controlled medications, testosterone being one of them, was not allowed state to state. So I couldn't see you, um, you know, in your state being in Florida. I could see you for telemedicine, but not. I could not sure. do anything yeah, yeah. controlled for you, basically. Yeah. Um, there was also other laws and rules, basically, where you had to see the patient in person once every yes. 12 months. Yeah. Um, obviously that has since been waived since COVID. So I can see those things kind of coming back, which kind of goes to why I'm going to be opening multiple clinics across the country because I'm yeah. anticipating that happening. Uh, so, and I'm also anticipating that happening, which is why I'm getting, uh, the MDs, you know, any doctors uh, that are working with us and for us licensed in multiple States. So we can service via telemedicine across the country still after these, you know, rules and laws change because yeah. the only reason that we're able to do this um, across state lines is because the DEA loosened their guideline. Yeah. And I read through all the laws and stuff like that. And I was talking mm -hmm. to um, one of our mutual uh, um, doctors you know, who does this stuff and he only would do Florida and we were going through the laws together and there was, we couldn't come and I, I'm pretty good at this kind of stuff. There was no definitive, Hey, you can do this with these types of medications and this type of treatment for, you know, this duration of time. It was all kind of up in it, like all the laws, like referred to other things. And it, it, it wasn't like a case law where it's, you know, Marbury versus Madison. This is the law, right? It was very <laughs> convoluted. And, and I just kind of gave up and he did too. Cause he was like, no, I'm not going to deal with it. I'll just treat people in Florida and go along my way kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, this was all this was all the way it was because of the Ryan Hyatt Act, um, which basically limited the state to state prescription and transport and, uh, you know, the prescribing of controlled substances. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that law or what that with that uh, with that name. He was uh, he was a young he was a young no. teenager, ended up overdosing on uh, prescription painkillers that he was getting prescribed via telemed by a doctor oh, wow. that I guess was not doing telemedicine properly. Wow. So and that's what I, that's, that's where that law came from. And basically they halted and loosened the restrictions on that, but it's still a law. So yeah. as soon as the DEA says, Hey, we're going back to normal. All of these online only TRT clinics that are doing telemedicine, they're all shut down overnight. And if they aren't, <laughs> they're yeah. now committing a felony with every prescription they do. Yeah. So, you know, yes, you're going to you're going to see and you are seeing and I mean, I see it literally every day. I think I see a new online TRT clinic pop up. every week. <laughs> yeah. You Jim know, Bob's TRT clinic. Call and me I'm, out. Um, With and I'm no doctor at, even on the page at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, OK, you know, if you're helping patients, I love it. You know, I, I'm not big on uh, on bad mouthing or anything, any clinics that are competition oh, yeah, yeah. No. that are competition with me, you know, there's way more than, you know, there's too many patients for all of us to even deal with. That's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, these, these clinics that are kind of doing it disingenuously, they're doing it for money purposes only. They're just kind of, you know, pumping and dumping these patients, basically just kicking out medication as fast as possible to make the buck. Yeah, exactly. And they're going to be gone as fast as they got here. But what wow. happens to those patients is, is my problem. That's where that's where oh, I yeah. really get miffed about it, because, you know, let's say these places, you know, have investors and they put one hundred thousand dollars in advertising, they get twenty thousand patients. OK, well, now the law changes next month. Where do those twenty thousand patients go? Because now they can't service them. Wow. You know, that's, and that's, that's scale. Kind of right? We're goes. talking about millions of people. Right. So, like, this is not like something to scoff at like this is a, a major problem 
From what I remember, though, are, are nurse practitioners able to treat nationwide with controlled medications? Do they have like an exemption or something like that? Yeah, so currently they can, and they can practice in several states without a medical doctor uh, supervising them. Uh, so there are several states that can do that. Florida is actually one of them. Um, regardless of that, we still have a medical director who's a doctor. We sure. have uh, two of them now. And, you know, we we like to have the doctors on staff here because sure. it just kind of it just kind of helps. It's an extra measure of protection. It's an extra layer of oh, knowledge. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but I mean, nurse practitioners, they can do the same thing that doctors are doing with this hormone treatment. Uh, yeah, I kind of ask that way because I, I see where there's an area in which we have a lot more nurse practitioners getting into. But I think it's also a functional piece of obviously the licensure and being able to operate in, in multiple states. But me personally, it's my personal opinion. I'm really excited where nurse practitioning is at in terms of HRT and functional medicine because they really are able to get out of the like the fancy Morgenthaler researcher, uh, Harvard, NYU <laughs> stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, they take a bottom up approach to HRT and I, I like it better personally. It's just my personal opinion. I, I, I don't think I've actually worked with an MD before directly uh, with this treatment. I'm pretty sure I have. Maybe maybe one place, but at least not where currently. I'm actually working with a with a nurse prac, uh, you know, as well. So, and I really enjoy, you know, kind of what we do, and he's able to go through things and explain them a little bit better, uh, in my opinion, than than MDs do. Yeah. So uh, you're you're absolutely right about most uh, most doctors out there. The nurse practitioners seem to, you know, really have a more open mind towards it. They're usually a little bit younger. Um, they have a little bit more modern education where the doctors, I mean, let's be real. Yeah, doctor, that's part of it. Okay, too. Yeah. Even if the doctor just, even if the doctor started working right now, he's getting educated as late as 10 years ago. It took him a long time to actually get out oh, of his own. Yeah. to go through everything. So, you know, is he really updated on every single bit of information? Is he really huh. researching everything? I think not. Um, you know, and they kind of get set in their ways sometimes. But then again, that goes with yeah. older nurse practitioners as well. Sure. Um, <laughs> I don't want to put two and two together, though, but that's a very uh, important insight for other owners, you know, like yourself, is something to think about, right? So obviously, you're going to want a medical director. But if you want to have a modern, ahead of the times, you know, kind of person, you probably want the newest person that's being trained who has the knowledge and the knowledge base of, of what you're doing. But there's also the aspect, right, where you're, you're working with patients on a day-to-day -day basis and just in your head, you have that muscle memory, whereas MDs have a giant job, they're doing all this different stuff, whereas, you know, NPs have more of a, a dialed in specific approach to what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we got really lucky with uh, Dr. Joe Clark up in the uh... Aspire Rejuvenation Pittsburgh office. And I mean, he's, he's absolutely amazing. The guy's been in emergency medicine for oh, really? like okay. 28 years or something like that. But, you know, he went through the uh, world link medical advanced BHRT ah, training yes. with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he's going to do some A4M classes. He's uh, going to do all this stuff, but I mean, he's, he's really well versed. He's very modern in his approach. He's not set in his ways whatsoever. So, you know, he's the type of doctor that I really like for this kind of uh, for this kind of medical approach, you know, yeah. and he's not modern in education. I mean, a guy went to school years and years and years ago, oh, really? <laughs> but, nice. well, you know, he's been he's been a doctor for almost 30 years. So the guy uh -huh. uh, 25 years. So the guy's been around, but he is very modern in his mindset because hormone replacement for him and hormone therapy and optimization changed his life personally. Wow. He started looking at it. He, uh, you know, got treatment himself. He educated himself. And this is how he got into the industry. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of, I wanted to have a, a, a podcast eventually with him too, because I, I, I'm really interested in kind of the, the personal aspects of, you know, what the personal stories are for docs too, because we only talk about it. It's kind of more of the promotional and like the, the high level stuff. Even in the um, the industry itself, we don't really have like the personal stories of like actual docs getting treated and then using what they've learned from themselves to help other people. Like it really doesn't connect and we really need more of a story around, you know, where the treatment is and how it can work for other people based on your own personal history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he'd be a great person to talk to. He's uh, he's, like I said, very educated on the uh, subject matter. 
He went through the uh, advanced BHRT training. I think he has one more part to finish, and then he's 100% certified. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so, I mean, he's he's the man when it comes to this stuff and you know, he's going to be down, he's going to be down here uh, at the Aspire Rejuvenation Orlando office, I think one or two weeks a month. And he's going to oh, wow. be, okay. yeah. Yeah. And he's going to be down here doing some consultations uh, here for Orlando patients as well. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I, I really do appreciate you kind of going through all of this and whatnot. My whole goal with this is to get as many clinics promoting their stuff in the open and <laughs> Like, especially the owners, too, actually talking about, you know, what they've created. And, too, like, you're an, like for me, I'm, I'm focused on veterans transition and, like, helping them find a path into which you're not going to be stuck in an office and hating your life. And I was impressed when I first found out about what you were doing. It was, oh, shit, this is really cool. You took an awesome career of, of what you did prior, adapted that, and went forward and then created something that really has exponential growth as long as you kind of stay ahead and do the right stuff, right? But you, you're, not, you're not having to deal with all the stuff that I did, you know, going to Iraq and Afghanistan and working in D.C. with grumpy, uh, you know, government employees and all that kind of stuff and a, a different path that I, I find very interesting and more veterans need to know about it, that you don't have to just do what everybody else is doing. You can maybe take your approach and, you know, apply that to your own personal life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, when I when I talk to anybody, whether it's a, a law enforcement officer that wants to transition out of that, or I talk to people that were in the military, career military, you know, the skills that you are learning, you know, in law enforcement, military, you know, even fire, even though I make some fun of uh, my fire <laughs> guys, you know, how the law enforcement yeah. fire guys get, uh, you know, those skills that you're learning in there, they really do translate if you know how to kind of hone them and focus them in the way that you uh, really want. And, you know, I mean, I would I would be hiring people that are ex-military over most uh, people that are, you know, civilians their whole life, almost nine times out of 10, because most of the time they have a good head on their shoulders. They know how to work. They're dedicated. They're loyal. You know, these are things that any business owner really should look at very yeah. uh, in, intently, you know, when it comes to anybody that wants to, you know, further themselves outside of that kind of career. Absolutely. And too, right, and honestly, with most of these clinics, none of them have anybody who's actually on the treatment as a patient care coordinator, which I am, well, I agree that you want some nice sorority people who are uh, great marketers and they're shiny and bubbly and they're doing their thing, <laughs> but we need some gruff salt dog uh, Marines that are on staff who are going through the treatment as well. And, you know, they, there's a balance and I, I agree. Okay. Defies doing great things. I'm going to probably have an interview with them soon too. You know, they, they have a, got a good model, but it's, there's lacking the industry is lacking in, in functional people who are the patient people who actually know what they're talking about and are doing it personally. Cause everybody that I've talked to, you know, there's regular people and they're marketing grads, but they're not actually on the treatment. They really don't know what it feels like. Yeah, see, that's that's one of the things that I really I really like about how I've kind of modeled this. I mean, I've tried, you know, outside of like the, you know, female uh, hormone treatments and things like that. Yeah, I've tried <laughs> almost every product that we have, HRT wise, diet wise, you know. And I mean, I, I even tell pharmacies, I'm, you know, when they're when they're trying to uh, bid to get our business. You know, they're like, hey, we have a new peptide or, hey, our peptides are better than this place's peptides or, hey, you know, try our TRT. We have a new testosterone blend that will work better than what you're using now. I'm telling them, like, listen, I'm like, I trust nothing you say until I try it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Actually, so like, speaking of that blend thing, so somebody was talking about it in a group and uh, Derek from More Place, More Dates talked about how if you have a blend of testosterone, your dial, uh, diurnal rhythm the clearance rate in terms of where, how it clears, you're going to be going as a base in trouble, base in trouble, base in trouble. And it's constantly going to be going on and off. Whereas obviously the whole point of testosterone cypionate or just a straight ester is one constant level. And so it kind of defeats the whole purpose. So it sounds good in a marketing language, but and obviously it's individual, right? But it's just a good example, right? Of something that unless you tried it yourself, 
you don't really know actually what it's experience is like where you have a fast acting and a long acting all together and then your hormones are all over the place <laughs> sure yeah well you're you're gonna have to basically experiment and test your dosing protocol because you know just like you said you know how a cypionate is going to react in your body and let's be real your half-life of cypionate might be yes. four days where my half-life might be two or seven you know what i mean so I, uh, you know, some people absorb faster than others, and that's going to be the same thing if you're using like a blend like a cypionate propionate, you know, which Absolutely. is the most common blend that I see. And you know, people need to realize like, hey, there is no magic when it comes to this, yeah. and <laughs> it is very extremely individual. So you know, me telling somebody like, hey, we have the best testosterone because we have this proprietary blend. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we don't. We like I, I tell everybody. I thought I, I get people sometimes asking me, why should I come to Aspire Rejuvenation? And I, I straight up education tell them, of the doctors. I mean, <laughs> well, I, sw I swear it's ex exactly what I tell them. And, and they laugh when I say it. And I'm like, I'm like, we don't do anything different than any other testosterone uh, or hormone replacement clinic out there. And they just kind of look at me puzzled. And I'm like, we don't. I'm like, and if anybody tells you that they do something different than the rest of the clinics, they're lying. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I basically tell them, I'm like, we are doing well because we are here for our patients. We are educating our patients. We have highly educated staff and providers, and we really give a patient care that is second to none, in my opinion. I may be biased, uh, <laughs> but, you know, our customer service and patient care, I think, is second to none. People are, you know, very quick to get responses. We are very responsive with any patient having an issue. Uh, you know, it's just we 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 react different because I was a patient at a TRT clinic before oh, wow. I ever opened a clinic. Oh, really? OK. So I knew kind of what this was. I knew kind of what I didn't like about certain places. And customer service and patient care was number one. That seemed to be lost in this whole, you know, medical industry and this whole uh, yeah. clinic idea where people just weren't getting treated like a good customer or a good patient. And that's kind of where we separate ourselves. Yes, we offer the same testosterone cypionate that everybody else does. Nobody <laughs> has anything different. It's all the same stuff. Are our protocols maybe a little bit better? Maybe. Is there more that we can learn? Absolutely. You know? But and when we're it comes kind of speaking about like the, the number mm -hmm. piece of it or whatnot, if you're comfortable with it, what's kind of the average? So someone that's just doing a TRT or TRT and HCG, mm -hmm. uh, do you do it a month? Are you doing the 10 week uh, kind of thing? What's your model behind that? And how much would it cost for someone to, to get treatment at Aspire? Treatment so it's, it's really, it's really easy uh, for us because, and we do the 10 week model and the, okay. easy, the easiest way to do that is because let's just say the, uh, you know, the median dose, because everybody looks at it like, hey, what's what's the dose of TRT? Pretty much everybody. 100 to 300 milligrams, somewhere yeah, exactly. in there. <laughs> so somebody, you know, somebody always asks, what's the cookie cutter program? And we yeah. all know what it is. 0.5. It's your AI mix then. <laughs> 0.5 cc twice a week, you yeah. know, or one cc once a week. So basically 200 milligrams a week. So if you look at that cookie cutter program, that 10 milliliter vial is going to last you 10 weeks. So yeah. You know, we we have our we have our package. It includes a 10 milliliter vial. It includes a 5,000 IU vial of HCG. It includes your syringes, your shipping, everything. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. So everything's included. It gets shipped straight to your door from the clinic, or not from the clinic. I'm sorry, from the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, you're paying $340 for that package. Now, oh, if cool. you're, wow, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. If you're on that, if you're on that cookie cutter 0. 0.5 twice a week or 200 milligrams a week, then it's going to be a 10 week package. But most people okay. are not starting at that point. Most people are starting at, you know, 0. 0.25, 0. 0.3 twice a week. So you're looking at a, you know, maybe up to a 16 week package, that's you know, great. for, for, uh, $340, you're, you're looking pretty good. Um, I appreciate you talking about the numbers too. So I, obviously when you go on some of these websites, they'll try to do some sneaky, <clears throat> like a once a week thing, or you know, they, they, they do the numbers by the week and have to calculate, what are you talking about? And calculate it up. Oh, okay. It's like, you know, one pound, whatever it is, you know, per week, but the numbers are very important. And obviously when we're, 
you know, some of the, like my personal friends that are going to be listening to this, mm-hmm. some of them are broke, right? So, and including myself, I don't have a lot of money and I'm, I'm actually changing to a regular doctor who works at a big medical institution who does optimization, but I'm changing to him because of that. I, Cause I can't personally pay for the, you know, the big clinics thing or whatnot, but the numbers are important. And also when we're talking about HCG, that stuff is not cheap. And especially if you're trying to get a lady uh, pregnant, it is definitely not cheap uh, to utilize that medication. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, HCG is not cheap. We do sell uh, HCG, uh, you know, prescribed HCG to patients as well. And I mean, you know, where we were able to sell it for a hundred dollars, I think, or maybe even seventy-five dollars for a five thousand IU. I'm thinking pretty far back, almost uh, a year and a half, two years ago now, before the shortage. You know, now that same vial of HCG. The patient costs 125 bucks. You're talking a fifty dollar yeah. increase in a year, and you know it's not because I'm trying to pad my pockets. It's because the the price of the HCG literally went up almost 500 percent on me. You know? Well, speaking so speaking of that, just to kind of clear it up for people who don't know, there's really no overhead in terms of TRT. Now, Royal Medical, I will give them a, a good. I'll give them a good tap because they're the ones who figured out how to market and how to charge an extreme amount. And I agree with them, they actually should. If you're doing a national level, you're taking on you know, so much stuff and you wanna be able to do this at scale, you're gonna need money to pull that off and you might as well do it for double. And I agree with them that they should, but there's really not much leeway in terms of what this is. And pretty much everybody's, you know, what you're, you're the cost that you're talking about, but the numbers are very important uh, for folks. There's not a lot of people that, you know, have a lot, a lot of money. So it, especially for them, but it's all pretty much the same. And, and, and also for someone who's trying to get into the business, there are no margins to this, right? So there are other stuff that you can do, but right, the, the singular treatment, right? You're only working with so much, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, basically when, when people come to us and they're like, Hey, your price is way better than this place. And I'm like, I promise it's not because I get the medications cheaper. It's just that they are raising their price and yeah. you know they're they're quadrupling basically you know what they what they are paying for it for retail and i'm not you know i am, well, I I am- too i'll mention this as well so on the on the bhrt pellets thing don't mm-hmm. do the pellets it's a scam in my personal opinion <laughs> this is not on you this is a scam in my personal opinion and although i kind of agree that maybe there's a use case or something like that i actually had a cop who was working in Pit, uh, Pittsburgh, the first clinic that he went to, he's active a cop right now, they wanted to put it on pellets. It was okay. Let's say in a crazy world, there's the medication works the best thing it could possibly work. What does a cop wear on his hips every single day? Mm-hmm. A belt with 50 pounds of stuff. Like the contraindications for a cop wearing, uh, putting on pellets. It's like, no, you don't do that. Like... <laughs> Yeah, silly things that some places just don't think about. Um, we don't we don't do pellets at any of our clinics currently. Uh, we could. There is that's probably so. If you're going to talk about a business standpoint, yeah, exactly. Pellets have kind of getting at that. <laughs> pellets have the biggest profit margin out of any BHRT uh, there is in the industry. So pellets, yeah. if a doctor is offering pellets, they're not offering it because it's better. They're probably offering it because <laughs> they're going to make a shitload of money off you. That's yeah. just the god's honest truth. Yeah. Um, do they work somewhat? Do they work in <laughs> some people? Sure. Would I ever use them? No. Would I ever it's prescribe? Would I, I ever have them prescribed yeah. at my clinics? No. Um, so if that tells you anything, there there are compounded uh, versa based creams and injections that are going to work a hundred times better. You have unlimited, uh, you know, uh, dosing potential. Basically, you can adjust anywhere you need at any time. Um, with oh, a man, I cannot imagine how bad that is for a doc, but you just did this pellet. Now the person's a hyper responder. They're in 5,000 total testosterone. They're freezing like 300 or something crazy. They got mm-hmm. all these side effects. And now they have to bring the patient to take the pellets out. <laughs> yeah. God. Or or even worse, they say to wait it out. I've heard that one before from <sighs> patients that come to us. They say, well, I, I skyrocketed. I was like a, a horny 13 year old that just went through puberty. And, you know, and then two months later, they're basically crashing because they burned through that pellet so quickly. And now the doctor won't give them a new pellet until they're four or five months in and they feel like garbage for two months. So, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a, 
you know, it's like a, a high point and then you're going to a low point and then you're going to go to a high point and a low point. I'm like, I'm looking at him I'm like, why didn't you just do injections? And he yeah. said, well, my doctor didn't offer them. And I was like, well, it's because he wanted Ooh. to make a lot of money off you. And, and honestly, for the, you know, for other owners or people who are going to start clinics, the pellets don't help you and you're going to get tons of negative reviews and there's going to be tons of things that you're not going to really like and you're going to lose money in the long run. And it's not optimal uh, medication. It's not how the, the original designers of testosterone created the medication to work in the first place. So don't do it. There's no point to it. You're going to harm your own practice and your patients are going to get better care. So it's, it just doesn't make any sense. And even though on paper, it's more money in the long term, it's not even worth it, even on the margin side. So, yeah, that, my, my whole model here, like I'm, I'm, of course, I'm a businessman. I'm in this to oh, uh, yeah, make, make a living. I am starting clinics to make a living. But, you know, just like I was saying earlier, why are our prices way cheaper than this clinic or that clinic? Hey, how come you're getting this? I'm getting this for half the cost or a quarter of the cost. I'm like, well, it's not because I get it cheaper. It's because I'm just not price gouging the hell out of you for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I'm, you know first, we, I'm making margin. I'm making yeah. I'm making a margin on everything that we do and prescribe and sell, of course. But I'm just but you're paying for the education of the doctors and it people doesn't who actually care. Yeah. Yeah. But it just doesn't make sense to me to price gouge some of these medications. I mean, I have people coming from other clinics that they're paying, you know, for an amino injection. They're paying five hundred dollars a month for I'm like, Ooh. I'm like, no, I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, you can get a 30 milliliter vial from my clinic for 160 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like, that, that's madness pricing. I'm like, you're spending three times the amount for no reason. Oh, wow. And it's the same drug from the same pharmacy. If that doesn't oh, tell no. you anything, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you know, I've already took up, you know, a lot of your time. I really do appreciate you kind of getting in to, you know, some of the details, but also getting into your kind of your story as well, because this kind of lost and I, I really want to have this going where I talk to more and more people and we have their personal stories along the, you know, the kind of industry stuff or kind of the, the normal TRT questions, but it's that personal stuff that really does make a difference. And, and two, if I would have heard from you, I'll over the same age group. So it, it probably wouldn't happen, but if I would have heard from you when I was like 25 or something like that in dealing with this and just came back from Iraq and I had something I can actually associate with, I probably would have got it tre treated you know, earlier and I wouldn't be in the situation where I am now where I'm trying to lose like 80 pounds and it's a long road to do that. So, Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, for anybody that's listening, you know, there's a lot of great clinics out there. So, you know, don't take any of the negative things that we said on here as law or that my clinic is better than anybody else's. There's a lot of amazing clinics out there with a lot of amazing providers out there. Everybody does a difference. You know, we're we're here to help people. And Brad, I appreciate you doing this uh, podcast because it's going to just get some information out there and get some yeah. people some hope, you know, that, you know, these treatments are out there. These treatments are, you know, affordable to to a point. Um, you know, we, we make them as affordable as we can here. And, you know, if there's anything that anybody needs from us here at Aspire, you guys can get us on our website, AspireRejuvenation.com, where you guys can call us at our clinics. Um, and we'll uh, we'll definitely do our best to help you. Awesome. I really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Um, once I get back to the house, I'll uh, shoot you a message and hopefully um, everything recorded. And everything is great. <laughs> um, it's says it's recording, so hopefully yeah, it's doing its thing. But I really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. And I'll definitely want to talk to some of your other clinic folks as well, some of the, the providers or whatnot. They're free at some point and do like a 30 minute 20 minute kind of thing that the real short and sweet of their kind of knowledge and whatnot and kind of get their story out there as well. If it's possible. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.